Book of Genesis, chapter 18. Abraham's Visitors The Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebinth of Mamre. As he sat in the entrance of his tent, while the day was growing hot, looking up, he saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. And bowing to the ground, he said, Sir, if I may ask you this favor, please do not go on past your servant. Let some water be brought, that you may bathe your feet, and then rest yourselves under the tree. Now that you have come this close to your servant, let me bring you a little food, that you may refresh yourselves, and afterwards you may go on your way. Very well, they replied. Do as you have said. Abraham hastened into the tent and told Sarah, Quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make rolls. He ran to the herd, picked out a tender choice steer, and gave it to a servant, who quickly prepared it. Then, he got some curds and milk, as well as the steer that had been prepared, and set these before them, and they waited on them under the tree while they ate. Where is your wife Sarah? they asked him. There in the tent, he replied. One of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will then have a son. Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, just behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and Sarah had stopped having her womanly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, Now that I am so withered and my husband is so old, am I still to have sexual pleasure? But the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I really bear a child, old as I am? Is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do? At the appointed time, about this time next year, I will return to you and Sarah will have a son. Because she was afraid, Sarah dissembled, saying, I didn't laugh, but he said, Yes, you did. Abraham intercedes for Sodom. The men set out from there and looked down towards Sodom. Abraham was walking with them to see them on their way. The Lord reflected, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, now that he is to become a great and populous nation, and all the nations of the earth are to find blessing in him? Indeed, I have singled him out so that he may direct his sons and his posterity to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord may carry into effect for Abraham the promises he made about him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grave, that I must go down and see whether or not their actions fully correspond to the cry against them that comes to me. I mean to find out. While the two men walked on farther towards Sodom, the Lord remained standing before Abraham. Then Abraham drew nearer to him and said, Will you sweep away the innocent with the guilty? Suppose there were fifty innocent people in the city. Would you wipe out the place rather than spare it for the sake of fifty innocent people within it? Far be it for you to do such a thing, to make the innocent die with the guilty, so that the innocent and the guilty would be treated alike? Should not the judge of all the world act with justice? The Lord replied, If I find fifty innocent people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham spoke up again, See how I am presuming to speak to my Lord, though I am but dust and ashes? What if there are five less than fifty innocent people? Will you destroy the whole city because of those five? I will not destroy it, he answered, if I find forty-five there. But Abraham persisted, saying, What if only forty are found there? He replied, I will forbear doing it for the sake of the forty. Then he said, Let not my Lord grow impatient if I go on. What if only thirty are found there? He replied, I will forbear it. Doing it, I can find but thirty there. Still he went on, Since I have thus dared to speak to my Lord, what if there are no more than twenty? I will not destroy it for the sake of the twenty. But he persisted, Please, let not my Lord grow angry if I speak up this last time. What if there are at least ten there? For the sake of those ten, he replied, I will not destroy it. The Lord departed as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned home. Psalm 12, Prayer Against Evil Tongues For the leader, upon the eighth, a psalm of David. Help, Lord, for no one loyal remains. The faithful have vanished from the human race. Those who tell lies to one another speak with deceiving lips and a double heart. May the Lord cut off all deceiving lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say, by our tongues we prevail. When our lips speak, who can lord it over us? Because they rob the weak and the needy groan. I will now arise, says the Lord. I will grant safety to whoever longs for it. The promises of the Lord are sure, silver refined and crucible, silver purified seven times. Lord, protect us always. 
Preserve us from this generation. On every side the wicked struck, and the shameless are extolled by all. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. The cleansing of a leper. When Jesus came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And then a leper approached, did him homage, and said, Lord, if you wish, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I will do it. Be made clean. His leprosy was cleaned immediately. Then Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses prescribed. That will be proof for them. The healing of the centurion servant. When he healed, when he entered Capernaum, a centurion approached him and appealed to him, saying, Lord, my servant is laying at home paralyzed, suffering dreadfully. He said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion said in reply, Lord, I am not worthy to have you enter under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a person subject to authority, with soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come here, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Amen, I say to you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I say to you, many will come from the east and the west and will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the banquet in heaven, in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom will be driven out into their outer darkness, where there will, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, You may go as you have believed. Let it be done for you. And at that very hour, his servant was healed. The cure of Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus entered the house of Peter and saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and waited on him. Other healings. When it was evening, they brought him many who were poisoned by, or were, who were possessed by demons. And he drove out the spirits by a word and cured all the sick to fulfill what had been said by Isaiah the prophet. He took away our infirmities and bore our diseases. Catechism of the Catholic Church, chapters 80 through 90. The relationship between tradition and sacred scripture. One common source. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture, then, are bound closely together and communicate one with the other. For both of them, flowing out from the same divine wellspringing, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. Each of them makes present and fruitful in the church the mystery of Christ, who promised to remain with his own always to the close of the age. Two distinct modes of transmission. Sacred scripture is a speech of God as it has been put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. And holy tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles so that enlightened by the spirit of truth, they may faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad broad by their preaching. As a result, the church, to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation is entrusted, does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Apostolic Tradition and Ecclesial Traditions The traditions here in question comes from the apostles and hands on what they receive from Jesus' his teaching. An example and what they learn from the Holy Spirit. The first generation of Christians did not yet have a written New Testament, and the New Testament itself demonstrates the process of living tradition. Tradition is to be distinguished from the various theological, disciplinary, liturgical, or devotional traditions born in the local churches over time. These are the particular forms adapted to different places and times in which the great tradition is expressed. In the light of tradition, these traditions can be retained, modified, or even abandoned under the guidance of the church's magisterium. The Interpretation of the Heritage of Faith The heritage of faith entrusted to the whole of the church. The apostles entrusted sacred deposit of the faith, the depositum fidei, contained in the sacred scripture and tradition to the whole of the church. By adhering to this heritage, the entire holy people, united in its pastors, remains always faithful to the teaching of the apostles, to the brotherhood, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So in maintaining, practicing, and professing the faith that has been handed on, there should be a remarkable harmony between the bishops and the faithful. The Magisterium of the Church 
The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether it be in written form or the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the Church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. This means that the task of interpretation has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. Yet this magisterium is not superior to the Word of God, but it is its servant. It teaches only what has been handed on to it. At the divine command and with the help of the Holy Spirit, it listens to this devotedly, guards it with dedication, and expounds it faithfully. All that it proposes for belief as being divinely revealed is drawn from this single deposit of faith. Mindful of Christ's words to his apostles, he who hears you, hears me. The faith will receive with docility the teachings and directives that their pastors give them in different forms. The dogmas of the faith. The church's magisterium exercises the authority it holds from Christ to the fullest extent when it defines dogmas. That is, when it proposes in a form obliging the Christian people to an irrevo irrevocable adherence of faith. Truths contained in divine revelation are also when it proposes in a definitive way truths having a necessary connection with these. There is an organic connection between our spiritual life and the dogmas. Dogmas are lights along the paths of faith. They illuminate it and make it secure. Conversely, if our life is upright, our intellect and our hearts will be open to welcome the light shed by the dogmas of faith. The mutual connections between dogmas and their coherence can be found in the whole of the revelation of the mystery of Christ. In Catholic doctrine, there exists an order of or hierarchy of truths, since they vary in their relation from the foundation of the Christian faith.